All right, so our message today is April 7th, 2013. <clears throat> I don't know what we should call it, honestly. Why don't we do this? Let's preach it and then we'll name it. Is that fair enough? Amen. Turn to 2 Kings. We'll be in the 8th chapter. I think by most people's account, I'm an unusual pastor. I, I think when I introduce myself, I almost never tell people I'm a pastor until we've talked a while. That's a really revealing habit. And as I do that, and I say, uh, by the way, I'm a pastor, they're always shocked, right? And uh, the number one thing I get is you, really, you're a pastor. And uh, so I, I guess I don't fit the normal type. This scripture does not fit the normal place to start a sermon. And I'm just going to ask that you bear with me. I am doing my very best to follow what I think is the leading of the Holy Ghost. Somebody say amen for that. Amen. amen. Would you rather a written program? No. Would you rather some form and ritual, pomp and pack? Or maybe we could get together and just eat a cracker. Would that be okay? No, that's not okay. We want fresh bread from the living God. Amen. 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 Are you all in 2 Kings 8? Yes. By the way, Brandon, I'm proud of you. I'm excited. And I want you to know that I was about your age when Matthew Pero was born again. And watching him get born again affected my whole life. Because I knew of all people, if Matthew got born again, that I was in much worse shape than Matthew. I knew that. And it began to push me towards him. Not him being Matt, him being Jesus. And look. 20 plus years has passed. And we've been all over the globe. I can only imagine what he will do with your life. Would y'all do yeah. me a favor? Brandon stepped forward not knowing exactly what to do today. He stepped forward just saying that he wanted something with Jesus, something new with Jesus. Would y'all give him a hand for that kind of work? Kings 8, right? I will get back on track here. 2 Kings 8, 7. Elisha went to Damascus. Let me tell you why I'm starting in 2 Kings 8, 7. I just preached a message on deep convictions and masculine holiness. I think Elijah, the predecessor to Elijah, is probably one of those characters that anybody who has ever read the word has deep and abiding respect for. I mean, a man that commands fire from the heavens and can stand against hundreds and hundreds of false prophets and stand up to kings is amazing. But one of the things that I like the most about him is something people don't talk about very much. He had a successor, and he transferred something to that successor. And the successor did twice as many miracles, was twice as anointed, twice as called of God, twice everything as his predecessor. That successor is Elisha. All that we could leave this earth having at least one person that accomplishes twice as much as we did in our life. One person that takes a 30-fold that you were given and makes it a 90 or a 100-fold. One person that you could transfer everything that you have to and they could build on. This ought to be the goal of the people of God. We have to transfer something to the next generation. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Okay, now I preach the message I want to. So Elisha went to Damascus, and Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, was ill. When the king was told, the man of God has come all the way up here, he said to Hazael, take a gift with you and go to meet the man of God. Consult the Lord through him and ask him, will I recover from this illness? Isn't it interesting? This man has been an enemy Ben-Hadad has been an enemy of Israel. But he knows that Elisha is a real man of God. Friends, even the enemies of the gospel can recognize who are true Christians and who are not true Christians. Even our enemies take note of those that have actually been with Jesus. And when they have problems, who do they call them? See, this wicked king who has attacked Israel viciously in the past is now consulting Israel's prophet. He has a problem in his life. There are whole groups of people that will only seek the Lord if they're ill. They'll only seek the Lord if there is a terrible, terrible problem in their life. But how much better would it be 
to come to him of her own free will without being driven along by some of the omen. How much better would the meeting be with Elisha if he had gotten right during the day of salvation? Who knows, for Ben-Hadad, maybe that day has already passed. So listen to what he does. Verse 8, he said to Hazel, take a gift with you and go to meet the man of God. Do you know that no amount of bribery will get you anywhere with God? No amount of good works, no amount of giving away your millions of ill-gotten gain while still pursuing wicked ways will buy you favor with God. Have you noticed the philanthropists of the world are giving away money that they got by doing things that God would never do? <laughs> Why do people do that? Because they hope somewhere to ease their conscience. It's much more simple than that, isn't it, friends? You know what eases a conscience? When we become obedient to the Lord. So Ben-Hadad is sitting there sick. He's sitting there guilty. And now he knows that a prophet is coming and he wants to know, will I get better? Will I recover from this illness? <clears throat> How many times has somebody asked you to pray for a friend in the hospital? Mm -hmm. Raise your hand if you've ever been asked to pray for a friend in the hospital. This is a pretty common thing, isn't it? Hey, will you pray for my aunt's mother's brother sister because she had a toenail extracted last week, right? We get them all the time. I get them by the hundreds. What if the toenail is not the problem? What if the illness that they're asking to be healed from is not what is actually killing them? How many of you would love to go have surgery on a finger while you're having a heart attack? Hmm? See, so many times, in fact, I worked in the spinal care industry. I watched people that had cervical anomalies in their spine get releases in their corporal tunnel and it didn't fix it. And then they'd get a release in their elbow and it didn't fix it. And the reason that it didn't is because we never addressed the actual problem which was centrally located in the spine. How many times are people asking for prayer for the wrong thing? Is the Lord a healing God? Yes. yes. But He's a saving God. How good would it be for us to have blind eyes open, deaf ears open, only to go to hell with good ears and good eyes? See, this king is asking for something that is the wrong thing. He could have said, Elijah, would you come? And teach me how to follow God like you do. Because I, I respect it immensely. He obviously respected him. He wants to hear from God through him. But he's drawn the wrong conclusion. Hey, this guy's got power I don't have. Can he tell me if I will recover from my illness? Hazel went to meet Elijah. Taking with him a gift of 40 camel loads of all the finest wares of Damascus. This is like semis pulling up. He went in and stood before him and said, Your son, Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, has sent me to ask, Will I recover from this illness? Sometimes people know all of the right things to say. Your son, Ben-Hadad. Son in Hebrew is ben so when we say my son's name is Judah ben Jamin, we are calling him the praise of God. And then in the second phrase, we're calling him the son of happiness. Obviously, I hoped he would turn out better than me. Uh, I named him well, right? Son of has to do with the characteristics or the traits of a human being. Can ben Hadad really be Elisha's son if he acts nothing like him? No, but he knows to present himself in a submissive way. He knows because he's in a place of need to lowly humble himself and ask. But do you know what is better than asking the right way? What is better than becoming low in a moment of weakness? Having actually been like Elijah's son. Then he could come to him and say, hey, you're like a father to me. And I know that you hear from the Lord. Will you help me? Do you understand the different ways in which people approach God? Now listen to what we get here. We get a man who's going to get an answer to his question. Elisha answered, go and say to him, you will certainly recover. Come on, somebody say that's good news. You're going to receive relief from what you think is killing you. You're going to have a temporary reprieve for a few days. Everything will be
will be better. I know so many people that think that if they got a few thousand dollars today, everything would be better. But how many times have they thought that before? And it didn't make everything better. It's because we don't understand what is actually killing us. Elijah answered him, go and say to him, you will certainly recover. But the Lord has revealed to me, he will in fact die. Now is that a recovery or not? Well, it's a recovery from the illness, but he's still going to die a sinner. How well off has been Hadad then? That's not what anyone wants. Are you surprised to find out that many times when people are healed in crusades, I was talking with, with Jay yesterday. It's Jay Williams. His wife Judy is right. Wait, everybody, Judy. These guys have been around the world for the gospel of Jesus Christ. They have sacrificed homes. They sacrificed everything that they had and spent 20 years in a foreign land because they wanted people to know what you're presented with every day. That there is a glorious God who loves us and He wants to change us into His image. And one of the saddest things that Jay and I discussed is how many people we had seen dramatically healed, bones popped back into place, things grew back on their bodies, deaf ears opened, cancers healed, that then later walked away from God. And you have to wonder how on earth is that possible? It's when we don't know what actually we need. It's when we don't, aren't able to identify what is actually killing us. We've confused our circumstance with our state. To be healed of one thing and die of another doesn't make much sense, does it? Listen to how this finishes. Elijah answered him, go and say to him, you will certainly recover. But the Lord has revealed to me that he will in fact die. He stared at him with a fixed gaze until Hazel felt ashamed. Why would Hazel feel ashamed? They only had this conversation. Because in that moment, Hazel and Elisha both know something. Something the text hasn't told you yet. Elijah has looked into the spirit of Hazel. He's heard from the living God. And he knows what Hazel is about to do. He knows the wickedness that the man has plotted before the man has actually done it. Now this sounds like what an incredible moment, right? Hazel's fixing to be judged. Fixing, by the way, that's a Louisiana word. If you don't understand it, it means he's preparing to be judged. You know who else had this kind of moment? Cain. You know who else had this kind of moment? Everybody that's ever been confronted by sin. And Hazel could fall on the ground at this moment and do something with his shame. He could say, Lord, I don't want to walk away from you. I don't want to sin. What I want to do is follow you like Elisha does. But that's not about to happen. He's simply going to feel the shame. Shame has a purpose. The purpose is to drive you towards God. You were never supposed to live in it more than a few seconds. You were never supposed to dwell in it for weeks and months and years. It was never supposed to define your life. In fact, what it was supposed to do was simply give you an opportunity to turn it from it. Hazel has that chance, and he doesn't take it. And listen to what Elijah tells him. Gaze until Hazel felt ashamed. Then the man of God began to weep. Why is my Lord weeping? asked Hazel. Did you notice that Hazel calls him Lord? How many say Lord, but there is no true Lord of their life except them. How many can say Lord, Lord, and Jesus is not their Lord? They feel ashamed every time they're in His presence, but they don't do anything about the shame. They only know that when they're in the presence of the Lord, they feel ashamed and condemned. One of the purposes of a church is to confront sin. But the other purpose, and the only reason that you confront sin, is to give people the chance to turn from it. The Holy Ghost is not moving in this room to beat people down. Even if He has illuminated an area of your life that must change, a direction of your life that must change, the purpose is to relieve you from bondage. The purpose is to bring you into His power. The purpose is that you might have the abundant life that the Christian world speaks of and so rarely sees. Why is 
my Lord weeping? Hazel asked. Because I know the harm you will do the Israelites. God has shown Elisha what Hazel intends to do. He answered, you will set fire to their fortified places, kill their young men with the sword, and dash their little children to the ground, and rip open their pregnant women. Hazel said, how could your servant, a mere dog, accomplish such a feat? The Lord has shown me that you will become king of Aram, answered Elisha. Then Hazel left Elisha and returned to his master. When Ben-Hadad asked, what did Elijah say to you? Hazel replied, he told me that you would certainly recover. But the next day he took a thick cloth, soaked it in water, and spread it over the king's face so that he died. Then Hazel succeeded him as king. Is that not as wicked a thing as you could have ever heard of? You go to find out whether your master will be healed, find out that he will be healed, and then use it as an opportunity to kill him. There is an enemy that we have, and he is just that wicked. He will allow you to walk into a church building, allow you to feel shame in the presence of God because of things he talked you into doing, and then do his best to get you to leave so that he can kill you out there by telling you that God is against you rather than for you. And this has never been true. The only reason that this confrontation is occurring is so that the man has a chance to do what is right. You have a chance today. You get to do what is right. You know what Ben-Hadad and Hazel are famous in Israeli history for? See, we're Americans. We might know who Paul Revere is. You might know who Jorge Washington is, right? George Washington. You might, you might know some historical figures. But to us, to hear about kings of Israel is just like, yeah, and next, and next, and I mean, this guy did pretty much what the guy did before him. And it's difficult. But if you grow up as an Israeli, do you know what these two men are famous for? They're the kings of Aram. Uh, Cass, would you put that on the screen for me? I want to show you where this is. As soon as Cass gets it on the screen. Turn with me to Isaiah 9. Aram is in this top corner. Can y'all see where that little red dot is? This is Aram. It's the ancient kingdom of Assyria. And Aram, these two kings, Hadad and Hazel, invaded. Both of them did it. And they invaded down through this northern area of Naphtali, and they camped in Zebulun, and they attacked this entire area around, what's that ocean right there, that sea rather? The Sea of Galilee. Turn with me to Isaiah 9. There. Say there when you're there. there. Yeah. Come on, you know who's not there? Me. I hope to live up to what I preach someday. <laughs> Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by way of the sea along the Jordan. How many of you have heard that passage of Scripture before? Raise your hands. What we didn't have the historical context for is in the past, he humbled them. What does that mean? Well, it means that men who benefited from the prophets of Israel used the prophecies that were given them to go ahead and come into Israel and conquer and humiliate and destroy and burn and occupy. They entered through Zebulun and Naphtali. They were from Aram. And about a hundred years, maybe as little as 50 or as much as a hundred years, before Isaiah is speaking this word, first Ben-Hadad entered through that path. And they destroyed everything in front of them. And then his successor, who was a murderer, came in and did the same thing. So the people of God are in this area, but they have these oppressors. And every time they have hope in the living God, someone is grinding on them. This is the way some people view church, unfortunately. Church is here to grind on us. No, the living God wants to liberate us. He's here to break chains. He's here to set free. Now, Zebulun and Naphtali had not been ob obedient to the Lord either. This is not a situation where some are holy and some are unholy. It's a situation where all equally are under the power of sin. But the Lord is not willing to leave anyone 
in that position. So listen to the good word and you hear about what God wants to do in your life, just like he did in theirs. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. What kind of light? Great. Come on, somebody say great. great. We can talk all day long about how dark the darkness is, but that is not where it, what's important. There is a great light, and it will always overcome darkness. This is essentially the story of the creation. We have darkness that has enveloped the globe, the whole thing. No part of it that is not covered in darkness. This is where our lives were at some point, and for some of you still are. But then God's light appears because he's not willing that any of us would stay in oppression, stay in bondage, stay beat down, stay ashamed. He may have allowed you to feel shame in the past, somewhere along, say, 843 B.C. But by the time we get to 740 B.C., less than a man's lifetime, he is crying out with a message of hope because the living God never wanted to condemn us. He wanted to save us. Somebody say he wants to save you. He wants to save you. He wants to save us, friends. He is a great light, bigger than any darkness that we could bring into this room. He is a great light. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death. What does darkness cause? Oh, my. And the Bible study here recently. Uh, I understand that you took Corinthians 13 and you began to list on one side of a poster what love is. On the other side of the poster, you listed what love is not. Is, am I right? Yes. So when we say like um, love trust, well, there's a difficult one, isn't it? I love everybody. Do you trust them? Well, no, not really. Then we're not loving them. <laughs> love trust. What is it if we do not trust them? It's darkness, friend. And darkness brings death. If love is patient and we are unpatient, what is that? It's darkness and it brings death. While we were in India, my brother Steve, who's a very well-read man, found a book by a guy named Roy Hessian. And in the book, he describes the highway to holiness. But instead of telling you all the things that is the highway of holiness, he started in an unusual place. He told you what the highway of holiness was most certainly not. See, we think of darkness as something someone else is doing somewhere. But darkness is anything less than what God has told us to do. And when we live in darkness, it creates in us death. But God is not darkness. He's a great light. And light will always overcome darkness. He wants to liberate us today. He's proven it every day that that great light, which is what the Hebrews call the sun, rises and it pushes out darkness on the planet. Every time the earth revolves, it is a continuing testimony that he can bring you out of whatever kind of darkness it is, ranging from someone who is impatient to someone who is completely immoral in every area. It makes no difference. Light runs out Darkness. Somebody say light runs out darkness. Light runs out darkness. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Dawn is the beginning of the day, friends. A light has sprung into being. Have you ever been where you had no hope? One of the brothers today, James, was telling me about how he felt like he got punched in the stomach from the devil this week. I told him to go sit down and read Micah 7, 8. Guys, we can be sitting in total darkness, but the Lord will make His light shine for us so that our enemies cannot gloat over us, but instead we are raised up and restored in all that is required. He said we become obedient to what He tells us. Come on, that's good news. Amen. Tell me that's good news. Amen. This is no different than what the apostles preached. It's no different than what Jesus preached. They started with a message that said, Repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. And every other thing they ever said was in expounding upon that principle. We're always turning away from the shadow of death, from darkness, from shame, from things that will kill us, and turning towards the light. 
You know what is really edifying in someone's life? Walking in the light. It's the way plants grow, and it's the way the Christians grow. When we are in His presence, you cannot help but be edified. Darkness hates His presence, and it hides from it. It blames everyone and everything to justify why it sits in darkness. This is the very spirit that killed Jesus while he was there to be a great light. Oh, I want to walk in the light as he is in the light. I want him to show me every area of darkness. And then I'm such a spoiled child. I also want his power to be available for me to help me walk out of that darkness because I found out I can't do it on my own. Amen. Amen. You think of pastors as strong and I tell you the truth, we're weak. We are so weak that we are completely dependent upon the Lord or else our lives would be consumed by darkness. Are you weak or are you strong? When we see these verses, we see God's heart. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. No matter what our darkness, God's heart is to give us a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You may be near death, even as near death as Ben and Dad was, or the murder that Hazel was planning. But God wanted there to be light, and He gives the opportunity. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. The kingdom by its very nature is like light. Do you know how fast light is moving? It's 186,000 miles per second. Square, Fred, did I get it right? 186 or 7? It's fast. It's moving really fast. Do you know, if I was chasing you, let's just say that Judy is driving that big diesel Ford they have. And it's got a top speed of, she doesn't know, but I know, I own one. Let's just say that the governor shut it down at 96 miles an hour because of a lawsuit over tires, right? And so it's going 96 miles an hour. And I'm in my CRV, which has a top speed of about 50 miles an hour with the tailwind. I'm going to bear down on Judy. Actually, I can't. I'll never catch her, will I? So if she was chasing me, she's going to be going 46 miles an hour faster, closing that distance. You know you could never catch God. If he is light and he's expanding at the speed of light in every direction, he's never stopping, ever. You can't outrun him. This is why every time we come into his presence, it exposes some little dark thing. But edification is when we get rid of that dark thing so that we can grow in the light. He desires to have his light dawn in our heart and he is enlarging the people of God. He's enlarging them in step with His nature. His influence is all over the universe. It's spreading out all over the globe. Even as light is spreading in every direction. So is He. And He does it through you. The way that the kingdom advances is when darkness diminishes. Is this room well lit? Yes. <laughs> How well lit? Well enough to read? Yes. Well enough to perform surgery? Is every area of the room well lit? I intentionally left the ceiling dark. Do you know why? It's flawed. And I painted it black, the darkest color that I could find. Because it's terribly flawed. And I put it as far away from the light as I can. You know why? I didn't want you to see the flaws. See, we look around and we say, Oh, it's, it's, it's a pretty well lit room and it's good for us, but God is not like that. He's going to illuminate every single detail because He is holy. He is perfect. This is the heart with which we have to go after Him. That no area of darkness is acceptable. No area of darkness is okay. This doesn't mean we walk around condemned. It means we walk around going, He showed me one more day way to be like Him today. Amen. Praise God, I'm going to do it. Amen. And then we can feel good when we've done it. We can feel a sense of accomplishment in the kingdom because Christ is being formed in us. You have enlarged the nation. And what is that next phrase? Increase their joy. Oh my goodness. One of the men at the altar today asked for joy. Do you know what the product of joy is? 
If, when we are obedient, then we feel joy. And if you don't feel joy, you have the right to command your spirit to receive joy. In fact, the Holy Spirit is called the oil of joy in Isaiah 61. When we are obedient to Him, joy overflows. Amen. We cannot expect to be joyful while we are being disobedient. And if we are, that is a, perhaps the worst sign we could have. I want you to be full of joy. God wants you to be full of joy. He wants you to be confident. I have to walk through every Sunday morning a dimly lit room. Every Sunday morning. Matthew and I both rise around 4 o'clock on Sunday. Usually, because I'm a softie, my kids are sleeping in my bedroom. They're on the floor. I got a big, big family. Got kids everywhere. Even got a little dog in there. So the first thing that happens is I trip over the dachshund. He yells. The next thing that happens is I stumble onto Gabe. He's mortally offended. And then I kick Abby on the way to get to the shower. And then I repeat the process to go back to my closet. And then repeat the process to go back and shave. And on and on and on. Because we weren't supposed to walk in darkness, friends. And when we do, we hurt ourselves. We hurt everyone around us. No amount of darkness is okay. Because you don't know what you're missing when you're walking in darkness. If I have to confess, my day gets significantly better when I reach the downstairs coffee pot and do something. You know what I do when I get downstairs? I turn on the lights. And it makes me joyful immediately. It reminds me of what the Lord has done. Suddenly all things become visible. And I might even notice that I forgot to clean the kitchen the night before. But I'm still joyful because now I can see it. It was hidden before. Now I can do something about it. It was in darkness before. The living God wants us to have great joy. They rejoice before you. They pe as people rejoice at harvest, the only thing that makes you happier than coming into the light is watching other people come into the light. When I see a life turn around for Jesus, it doesn't matter to me whether there's 10,000 or one. I'm equally excited for the one is the 10,000 because I was that one. Oh, Christians, that we could see. You know what is edifying? To see people come into the light. Yeah. You don't know what it does to a spiritual walk that is sagging. To see someone born again and remind you why we're actually here. Yeah. We are here to spread the light, to increase the kingdom. Yeah. We are here to watch light dawn in darkness. Yeah. Am I mistaken? No. Or did our Lord say that we are the light of the world? Yeah. Yeah. Oh man, that we wouldn't put a lampshade over our light. We view that as just not witnessing. You know what else puts a lampshade over our light? When we walk in darkness, it dims the light. Oh, goodness, goodness, goodness. You know, it may be that I preach on this subject an awful lot. Perhaps that's because we're not yet walking in a way that shows us all to be in the light. Doesn't that make sense? Does the Bible have a lot to say about this subject? Yeah. Is the majority of the Bible about turning from darkness to light? Yeah. And then of course we'll have a lot to say on the subject. Of course. You know what the major point of Isaiah 9 is though? It's not darkness. The major point is that they have been humbled, broken, and beaten. But God was doing the new thing. The major point was in the restoration, not the beating down. Now I'm going to tell you the truth. God allowed the beating down. The people who did it were guilty and the people who received it were guilty. Nobody was righteous before the Lord. But the Lord gave them all a chance for something better. Now do you know how many years it is before this light actually shows up? Oh, a long, long time, friends. This is written in 740 B.C., thereabouts. Turn with me to Matthew 4. Say there when you're there. there. I don't know how long you have to wait for your breakthrough. I do know that in moments in our services, I am certain that you can have it right then. And this morning was one of them, and some of you got it. 
Sometimes people have been so trampled on in Zebulun and Naphtali. Sometimes the region around Galilee has been so beaten down by the Gentiles that we forget what it was like to walk in the light. It becomes our new normal. And so God does a new thing. Was Isaiah a mighty prophet? Yeah. He spanned, I, I don't even know how many kings. His ministry could be divided into four distinct sections. He, he did amazing things, as did Elijah. did amazing things. But at the end of the day, do you know what? They all had some darkness in them. So God sent somebody special to Zebulun and Naphtali. In the fourth chapter of Matthew, this very special appearance of the Lord starts in a temptation. Can we get Jesus to walk in darkness? Maybe if we tempt Him with the lust of the eyes, He'll walk in darkness. Wrong. Maybe if we tempt Him with the pride of life, He'll walk in darkness. Wrong. Maybe if we tempt Him with the lust of the flesh, He'll walk in darkness. Wrong. Proven righteous on all accounts. So in the 12th verse, look what happens. When Jesus heard that John had been put into prison, he returned to Galilee, leaving Nazareth. He went and lived in Capernaum, which was by a lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali. Zebulun and Naphtali are the west and north side of the Galilean area. They occupied the whole area and they had been so beaten down by the Gentiles that Jews began to refer to them as Galilee of the Gentiles. This would be a very Jewish way to call these people backslidden, to call them backwards, to call them country hicks, to view them as something less than those who lived in metropolitan areas in Jerusalem and had the best teachers and the highest centers of learning available. And where did Jesus make his ministry home? Leaving Nazareth, he went down and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali. Where does Jesus make his home? Among the downtrodden. Among those who have been so dominated by darkness, they need a great light. And that light has appeared to all men because all of us have been in Zebulun and Naphtali. All of us have been beaten down by darkness and the great light is appearing. This is the day that we can come out from under the shadow of death and walk in the light of the dawn. This is the day that our lives can actually increase in the nation of God and joy can grow and expand in us and we can see a very great harvest. This is where Jesus began His ministry. Do you know what else? It's where He gathered His fellow workers. I know this is not what is commonly taught but it's inescapable to an Israeli that is educated. That's why the devil worked so hard to keep the nation of Israel from even reading the New Testament. They would discover immediately that it is a very Jewish book meant to liberate them first and foremost, and then everyone else along with them. To fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah, the land of Zebulun and Naphtali, the way to the sea along the Jordan, Galilee, of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Look at verse 17. From that time on, what time on? When Jesus showed up where Isaiah had promised, among the downtrodden, among the beaten up, among those that murdering kings had come in and done terrible things, Jesus began to preach. What did he preach? Somebody say it out loud. What did he repeat? He preached repentance. This is the only answer. It's always the answer. Christians have the attitude that if we fast more, if we eat less, somehow or another, that's the answer. If we study more, that's the answer. That the answer is always something other than what it is. I understand. Jesus said this kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. But do you know what the first century teaches us? Fasting was always accompanied by repentance. The point was repentance. The point was to turn away from the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. The point was to get your eyes on what God's eyes were on. Everyone else. Repentance is the key to his heart. 
is the key to driving out darkness. It's the key to walking in increased joy and an enlarged life. A continual state of repentance is the key to revival, friends. Amen. I quoted Wednesday night Oswald Smith. The reason that I quoted him is I have been meditating on something that Pastor Bartlett gave me. And one of the points that he gave me from Oswald Smith's book said revival can only exist in a place of continual brokenness and repentance. Now what our minds would tell us is that revival exists when we repented and then moved into revival where repentance would no longer be necessary. Repentance is always necessary. It's a hard-hearted religious people that decide that it's no longer necessary. Guys, I want to do His will. Do you want to do His will? Yeah. Anybody in here want to do His will? Yeah. Look at who He's looking for. He went to the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. And what does verse 18 say? As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, He saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Where did He go to find them? He went to Galilee, the land of Zebulun and Naphtali, Galilee of the Gentiles. He went to the least respectable group of Jews he could go to and still be Jews. So much so that their very accents gave them away as they moved towards Jerusalem. People knew immediately that they were not from around here. This is who he chose. Because when somebody's been in great darkness, but they see an even greater light, they love the light. They love the light. He who has sinned much loves much. There is a parallel account to this that tells us the rest of the story. Turn with me to Luke 5 where we can read it. One day as Jesus was standing by Lake Gennesaret, this is another name for the Sea of Galilee, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. Why do fishermen wash their nets? Because they're done fishing. If you leave salt water on almost anything long enough, It'll burn it up. The Sea of Galilee is not actually salt. <laughs> it's a misnomer. It's a great inland body of fresh water. But if you leave water on anything long enough, it'll burn it up. We have outside a tent laying in a field. Do you know why? Because it got so rained on, we wanted it to dry before we put it up. If we rolled it up like it was, the first thing that goes are the threads. What is a net made of? Threads. These men have made their living from fishing. And they're washing their nets. They're getting ready to put them up. What does that tell you? We're done fishing. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. See, when we read Matthew 4, we hear just a message. We hear repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. But what we don't know is that Jesus is actually seated in a boat teaching an entire message that we don't have recorded. Listen to what happens. Verse 4. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Jesus could have told him before he cleaned the nets. <laughs> Jesus could have told him before he preached the sermon. Sometimes the Lord will allow you to be in a situation that is difficult. A situation that is the land of Zebulun and Naphtali so that you will be willing to listen to what He's trying to teach you. Do you know that one of the kings of Israel could not get the audience of another man? So he lit his barley fields on fire. And then the man came to him. Sometimes our lives smell like burning barley because God is trying to get our attention. He's trying to get us to run into His presence. And not only that, have a right attitude when we get there. He lit Ben-Hadad's field.
fields on fire, so to speak. He let him get ill. But all Ben had wanted was to be released from the illness. He didn't want to serve God. He lit Hazal's fields on fire, so to speak. He confronted his sin with a man of God in an unbroken gaze. But Hazel didn't really want to change. He just wanted what he wanted from God. Oh, what do we want today? Jesus waited until he was done preaching, and then he gives a command. It's not a request. It's a command. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Why deep water? Now, friends, I don't know. I'm not a fisherman. I have swam in this lake twice. I loved it. It's beautiful. It's a wonderful place. It's 18 miles across and 7 miles long. Or 18 miles long and 7 across. It's huge. But if he's telling him put out into deep water, I would guess that it's possible they had been fishing in shallows before. And I know that it's daytime now and that they had fished all night. How many of you are fishing in shallow waters and hanging out in darkness? The living God is calling us to walk into the blazing light and to go out into the mighty deep waters. Now, I never do this, but I'm going to quote the King James today because it says it better than the NIV said. That's my only admission to that, Pastor Bartlett. Would you put on the screen Psalm 107, because I don't know the King James Bible anymore. Verse 23. That they go down to the sea in ships that do business in the great waters. Verse 24. These see the works of the Lord and His wonders in the deep. We cannot stand in ankle-deep water and stand in darkness and think that we will have a great harvest. The Lord God is calling us out into the mighty waters. He's calling us out into the deep waters, the treacherous waters, the ones that are above your head that you have to depend on Him. And then while you're standing there in the bright, blazing presence of His light is when we let down the nets. Too long we've tried to play it safe. We've tried to play it easy. We've said, you know, if you kind of want to sort of, maybe you could, you know, have a better life now. You know, rather than expose deeds of darkness, we simply say they're not God's best for you. We are fishing in shallow waters at night. And the living God has allowed us to live in Zebulun and Naphtali so that we might hear a different message. One that says there is a blazing light. It will drive out all darkness, not a little darkness, all of it. Amen. You have to get out of the safety zone and go out into the deep waters of humanity. You have to go after the kind that not everybody is fishing for and let down the nets. Anybody want to let down the nets today? Yeah. You've got to go out in the deep waters to see the wonders, friends. These see the works of the Lord and His wonders in the deep. His wonders are not in the baby pool. They're not in the kitty end of the swimming pool. They are in the deep waters. Yeah. When He had finished speaking, He said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we work hard all night and haven't caught anything. Of course you haven't caught anything. If we are fishing in the darkness, if we are fishing in shallow waters, we will never be successful for the Lord. It's something He simply won't bless. Even if there are many, 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 many signs of what the world would call success, has it touched God's heart? Do you want to touch God's heart or do you want the minimum? Is your room well lit enough and you're satisfied with what's there? Or do you want it to blaze like the sun? I want all of Him, friends. All of Him, not a little bit. All that I can get. When they, listen, to, listen to His rationale. It's the way many Christians serve the Lord, including me at times. Master, we work hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. Lord, I'll do it if you make me. You, you're making me. I, will. I guess I have to do it then. 
What would happen if we wanted to? What happens if we wanted a reckless abandonment of all safety and precaution? What would happen if we wanted to drive out all darkness, not just the comfortable levels? Oh, I think we would see the Lord's wonders. When they had done so, oh, come on, say, when they had done so. When they had done so. How many times in our life can this be said of us? When we had done so. Whatever the Lord told us to do, when we had done it. Oh, this is the time of joy, friends. This is the time of the increased nation, the increased joy, the increased harvest. When we do what the Lord tells us to do. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. Nothing that we could conceive of. No machine, no religious institution will be able to contain the harvest that is coming when we can say we have done so, Lord. Amen. There is a revival that is going to shake the world unlike anything from the beginning of the world until now Hallelujah. because the very earth is going to proclaim His glory. Yeah. But can we say that we have done what He told us to do? Look at the verse. He said He begins to break the nets so they signal to their partners in the other boat. By the way, who are Peter and Andrew's partners? James and John. Oh, who is being prepared to partner with somebody? There is a harvest coming for everyone who wants the light that a net cannot contain. So they signaled for their partners in other boats to come and help them. And they came and filled the boats so full they began to sink. Why is that scary, friends? Because they are not in the shallow water anymore. They're out in the mighty deep waters where they have to depend upon the Lord at every turn. And in those deep waters, while they're about to sink because the harvest is so great, they're overflowing with joy. Do you know why? There's a great harvest. This is the hope that the Lord presents. It's not that we sit in darkness. That's not the hope. The hope is... You are who He is hunting for. The hope is that when we have done what He told us to do, He will have so met us in that hour of need that it would sink your ship if He wasn't causing you to float. But I'd rather depend upon Him causing me to float than me trying to float my own boat. Verse 8. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. I brought him to that conclusion. He had tried it his own way long enough. He was worn out and washed up. And it wasn't working. He barely had the will to even try again. But because the Lord said so, he went back out into the deep and treacherous waters. And for the first time in his life, he became a success. The Lord doesn't look at him and say, you're right, you terrible sinner, and kick him in the face. He takes the confession for faith. And he says, for he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that had been taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. The Lord didn't leave him in his sin. He didn't leave him broken down from a long, hard night. He didn't leave him washed up, nets put up. He taught him how to fish. The Spirit of the living God is in this building today. And He's in the building today not to kick you in the teeth. He wants you to come to the conclusion you're a sinner on your own so that He can teach you what He actually called you to be. A fisher of men. 
any hardship that you've had. He's allowed you to have so that you could hear his message. And he could turn you into what he actually called you to be. He does not want you to be ashamed, church. He does not want you to be guilty. He does not want you to be beat down. He wants to raise you up next to him as a co-laborer in the gospel, ruling and reigning the tribes of Israel with him. He wants you to fish for men right alongside him. But in his awesome wisdom, he gave us that choice, didn't he? 